This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Antichrist by Friedrich Nietzsche. Sections 43 through 47. 43. When the center of gravity of life is placed, not in life itself, but in the beyond, in nothingness, then one has taken away its center of gravity altogether. The vast lie of personal immortality destroys all reason, all natural instinct. Henceforth, everything in the instincts that is beneficial, that fosters life and that safeguards the future, is a cause of suspicion. So to live that life no longer has any meaning. This is now the meaning of life. Why be public-spirited? Why take any pride in dissent and forefathers? Why labor together, trust one another, or concern oneself about the common welfare and try to serve it? Merely so many temptations, so many strayings from the straight path. One thing only is necessary, that every man, because he has an immortal soul, is as good as every other man that in an infinite universe of things the salvation of every individual may lay claim to eternal importance, that insignificant bigots and the three-fourths insane may assume that the laws of nature are constantly suspended in their behalf. It is impossible to lavish too much contempt upon such a magnification of every sort of selfishness to infinity, to insolence, and yet Christianity has to thank precisely this miserable flattery of personal vanity for its triumph. It was thus that it lured all the botched, the dissatisfied, the fallen upon evil days, the whole refuge and offscouring of humanity to its side. The salvation of the soul, in plain English, the world revolves around me. The poisonous doctrine, equal rights for all, has been propagated as a Christian principle, out of the secret nooks and crannies of bad instinct, Christianity has waged a deadly war upon all feelings of reverence and distance between man and man, which is to say, upon the first prerequisite to every step upward, to every development of the civilization, out of the resentiment of the masses it has formed its chief weapons against us, against everything noble, joyous, and high-spirited on earth, against our happiness on earth. To allow immortality to every Peter and Paul was the greatest, the most vicious outrage upon noble humanity ever perpetrated. And let us not underestimate the fatal influence that Christianity has had even upon politics. Nowadays no one has courage any more for special rights, for the rights of dominion, for feelings of honorable pride in himself and his equals, for the pathos of distance. Our politics is sick with this lack of courage. The aristocratic attitude of mind has been undermined by the lie of the equality of souls, and if belief in the privileges of the majority makes, and will continue to make, revolutions, it is Christianity, let us not doubt, and Christian valuations which convert every revolution into a carnival of blood and crime. Christianity is a revolt of all creatures that creep upon the ground against everything that is lofty. The Gospel of the Lowly Lowers 44. The Gospels are invaluable as an evidence of the corruption that was already persistent within the primitive community. That which Paul, with the cynical logic of a rabbi, later developed to a conclusion which was at bottom merely a process of decay that had begun with the death of the Saviour, these Gospels cannot be read too carefully. Difficulties lurk behind every word. I confess, I hope, it will not be held against me that it is precisely for this reason that they offer first-rate joy to a psychologist, as the opposite of all merely naive corruption, as a refinement par excellence, as an artistic triumph in psychological corruption. The Gospels, in fact, stand alone. The Bible as a whole is not to be compared to them. Here we are among Jews. This is the first thing to be borne in mind if we are not to lose the thread of the matter. This positive genius for conjuring up a delusion of personal holiness, unmatched anywhere else, either in books or by men. This elevation of fraud in word and attitude to the level of an art. 
All this is not an accident due to the chance talents of an individual, or to any violation of nature. The thing responsible is race. The whole of Judaism appears in Christianity as the art of concocting holy lies, and there, after many centuries of earnest Jewish training and hard practice of Jewish technique, the business comes to the stage of mastery. The Christian, that ultima ratio of lying, is the Jew all over again. He is threefold the Jew. The underlying will to make use only of such concepts, symbols, and attitudes as fit into priestly practice, the instinctive repudiation of every other mode of thought, and every other method of estimating values and utilities, this is not only tradition, it is inheritance. Only as an inheritance is it able to operate within the force of nature. The whole of mankind, even the best minds of the best ages, with one exception perhaps hardly human, have permitted themselves to be deceived. The Gospels have been read as a book of innocence, surely no small indication of the high skill with which the trick has been done. Of course, if we could actually see these astounding bigots and bogus saints, even for an instant, the farce would come to an end and it is precisely because I cannot read a word of theirs without seeing their attitudinizing that I have made an end of them. I simply cannot endure the way they have of rolling up their eyes. For the majority, happily enough, books are mere literature. Let us not be led astray, they say. Judge not. And yet they condemn to hell whoever stands in their way. In letting God sit in judgment, they judge themselves. In glorifying God, they glorify themselves. In demanding that every one show the virtues which they themselves happen to be capable of, still more which they must have in order to remain on top, they assume the grand air of men struggling for virtue, of men engaging in a war that virtue may prevail. We live, we die, we sacrifice ourselves for the good, the truth, the light, the kingdom of God. In point of fact, they simply do what they cannot help doing forced like hypocrites to be sneaky, to hide in corners, to slink along in the shadows, they convert their necessity into a duty. It is on grounds of duty that they account for their lives of humility, and that humility becomes merely one more proof of their piety. Ah, that humble, chaste, charitable brand of fraud! Virtue itself shall bear witness for us. One may read the Gospels as books of moral seduction, these petty folks fasten themselves to morality. They know the uses of morality. Morality is the best of all devices for leading mankind by the nose. The fact is that the conscious conceit of the chosen here disguises itself as modesty. It is in this way that they, the community, the good and just, range themselves once and for always on one side, the side of the truth, and the rest of mankind the world on the other. In that we observe the most fatal sort of megalomania that the earth has ever seen. Little abortions of bigots and liars begin to claim exclusive rights in the concepts of God, the truth, the light, the spirit, love, wisdom, and life, as if these things were synonyms of themselves, and thereby they sought to fence themselves off from the world. Little super-Jews, ripe for some sort of madhouse, turned values upside down in order to meet their notions, just as if the Christian were the meaning, the salt, the standard, and even the last judgment of all the rest. The whole disaster was only made possible by the fact that there already existed in the world a similar megalomania, allied to this one in race, to wit, the Jewish. Once a chasm had begun to yawn between Jews and Judeo-Christians, the latter had no choice but to employ the self-preservative measures that the Jewish instinct had devised, even against the Jews themselves, whereas the Jews had employed them only against non-Jews. The Christian is simply a Jew of the Reformed Confession. 